insulin resistance, it's, it's odd, but people start like they're internally in their cells. It's like, they're starving. They don't have that sugar in their cells and they start feeling really depleted. And what happens is a lot of people are really tired, so they don't want to exercise. Mm -hmm. Right. But exercise will actually help increase insulin sensitivity. It'll help those cells listen to insulin better. So exercise is actually really important, but we're so tired that we don't want to exercise. And then on top of that, we just, we eat sweets and we eat processed foods just to help get us through the day. And those sweets, those processed foods, the cravings, you know, that's going to help us gain more weight and we're going to lose muscle over time. <laughs> so, um, Kelly, yay. I'm so happy that you're joining me today. Um, welcome to your body's way podcast. How are you doing today? I'm great. I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on today. I'm really excited, especially about the topic we're going mm -hmm. to talk about. It's a very important one and yeah. it just hits home for a lot of us. So very excited to be here. Yeah. And especially with you, I always love talking with you. I know. Um, so basically, I think what everyone needs to know is that um, we have known each other. God, has it been a year now? Do you think? Like about Probably, a year? Or yeah. longer. Yeah. Maybe, maybe a bit longer. So basically, um, just to kind of backtrack, you work for the prestigious and just the amazing um, Dutch test um, precision analytical and you're, you're a doctor at the lab um, and you basically give advice um, to uh, basically clients of the Dutch test and you give uh, basically feedback on the tests and you kind of help people out with um, you know uh, kind of figuring out what's going on with their clients and that's how we met so I was doing some <laughs> Dutch testing and I met you online and we just I remember that first conversation actually and for some reason we just hit it off straight away <laughs> <laughs> we just clicked you know with some people you just click <laughs> like, like straight away we're just like talking about our kids and um we're just talking about life and you know we, we got some work done as well but um mm -hmm. I remember after that we were kind of switching emails sending photos of our children and you know it was just it was awesome and um I remember that night I I sat down with my husband and I was just like I think I made a friend today <laughs> The Dutch test. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> honestly, honest to God, like he'll he'll definitely remember me saying that. I was just like, I think I made a friend today, and it's and um. So I was so happy to see that you're podcasting and you're like you're you're going on to different podcasts. And I was like, oh my God, Kelly! Like I need to invite you onto my podcast. So um, I'm so happy that you're here, and you're right. The topic is a really important one and I personally find it like I find it really interesting really relevant and it's basically about stress mm -hmm. it's about modern day stress um for females in particular because it's mostly females that are listening to this and um do you know what it's, it's such an important topic these days because don't you find that these days we are so the stress is just higher than ever and we are so overrun with things to do and we're so um easily contactable and we're just juggling so many things like families uh work um tr trying to be a better woman you know trying mm -hmm. to be creative and um exercise and you know just work on yourself but then also get you know bring in some money and it's it's just it's absolutely crazy and that the topic today um, is an important one, not only for ladies listening, but also it's something that I personally struggle with. And I, I don't know about you, and I'd be looking forward to kind of hearing what you say about it from your perspective as well. But um, I struggle with um, being way too stressed and taking on way too much and just basically feeling like I need to be productive in order to um, feel like I'm kind of worthy or if, if that yes, kind of yes. sounds if you well, can relate to that. I feel like you we, relate to that we do live in a society that values productivity oh. so um I I totally agree I feel like I feel like I've I've gotten better over the years but mm -hmm. definitely the type of person who's always doing something um always trying to achieve something always trying to go to the next level and I've really had to learn to kind of 
you know, just, just chill, chill out a little mm-hmm. bit, take a little more time to, to do nothing. I remember one time, a couple years ago, I was speaking to a naturopathic physician mm-hmm. who's pro- she's probably in her sixties now. And we were talking about just stress and how people are overworked and doing too much. And I think I was talking about my own stress and how I was doing too much. <laughs> as we all do, as we'll <laughs> be do. honest. Yeah. And she was like, well, what do you do on the weekends? And I was like, oh, well, the weekends are my time to have fun. I go kayaking, I go hiking. And I was just like listing off all these things that I do on the weekends. And she's like, wow, like when, when do you ever do nothing? When do you ever rest? When do you ever read a book? Uh, sounds oh, like I... you're a weekend warrior. And I was like, oh, wait, what do you mean? Uh, oh, I, I should rest. Like I need to just do nothing. <laughs> do nothing. Yeah, we don't get that. <laughs> that really made an impression on me. I was like, okay, I guess I can't work super hard during the week and be a weekend warrior. I mean, you can, but over time it might yeah. catch up with you. Because even fun things like going out, do, doing kind of like um, if you know, here in Cayman, we, you know, you've got water sports and you've got all of these, you know, you can go and visit the stingrays and um, boat trips and boat parties, like even that fun stuff, it's still, it's still something, you're still doing something. And I think what people really need to start thinking about, and, and I'm saying this because I need to think about it. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, and a lot of people, we, we need to start to value doing nothing like you just said because that's really where real recovery comes in I mean I I have all of these goals where I'm like I you know I want to you know I want to be I want to investigate my spiritual side so I'm like okay so I've got to meditate more so even the meditation has become like a thing a thing Mm -hmm. for me to do and I'm just like I want to be more creative I'm going to paint more and you know even something that I love that's painting it's still kind of something it's everything's just kind of ticking the box and I think sometimes there's a lot of value in in kind of just doing nothing and just completely relaxing and just doing something that really genuinely brings you back to yourself and Mm. um kind of calms your body down calms your hormones down you're you're the hormone expert in my eyes like female (laughs) hormone specialist you know everything there is to know about hormones and and that's basically what um today is about we're going to be talking about stress and we're going to be talking about cortisol the big c yes (laughs) everyone knows about cortisol right Mm -hmm. like you can speak to any layman and they're like yeah but i know about cortisol like the stress hormone so stress hormone mm -hmm. (laughs) so um so i guess i really want to have a really nice chat about this because it's so important um first of all uh, if you could just explain to people, so basically, what is cortisol first of all, and um, where is it kind of found? Where does it get released into? And because you're um, a doctor at um, kind of analysing the Dutch tests, which is like a famous hormone test, um, what is a normal cortisol pattern, and what is an abnormal cortisol pattern for someone who's stressed? So that's kind of like the package, really. So let's go into mm-hmm. it. Yeah, yeah. So cortisol, a lot of people know it as the stress hormone, because it is released during stress. Um, And it's released during all types of stress, you know, whether that's an actual stressor, like let's pretend a lion escaped from the zoo, and it's chasing you, (laughs) like Mm. that's an actual stressor, cortisol will be released. Um, But even perceived stress, let's say you've got a deadline coming up or a presentation to give and you're, you're nervous about it, you know, that perceived stress can cause cortisol to be released into the body. Um, And that cortisol, it's being released from the adrenal glands. And the adrenal glands are these two glands that sit on top of our kidneys. Um, But even pain, like pain is a stressor on the body. Vigorous exercise is a stressor on the body. Like those are going to cause cortisol to go up too. Mm-hmm. I've seen cortisol elevate from headaches, migraines, um, even caffeine withdrawal. So caffeine withdrawal, that, that's interesting because usually yep. I, you would say like caffeine is the one that brings cortisol up, but even <laughs> yeah. caffeine withdrawal, that's interesting. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sometimes we're testing people will stop caffeine because they want to see their natural cortisol without the influence mm-hmm. of caffeine. Um, but they're so, you know, they're so addicted to it. They're so used to it every day. Their body is used to having that caffeine every morning that when they stop it, they get headaches. They don't feel well. They feel hungover and you see it in their cortisol. Wow. Just, it just goes up. 
Um, so I've seen a lot of interesting cortisol patterns kind of matching up to even illnesses. I've seen that people get COVID or they've got the flu and their cortisol goes straight up. Um, and that's because, you know, cortisol does a lot of things in the body. Um, it's anti-inflammatory. It'll modulate the immune system. Um, it helps mobilize sugar into the bloodstream, you know, so that we can have that energy to run away from the lion. Uh, it, you know, everyone thinks that, sorry to cut you off, but everyone yeah, no. thinks that cortisol is like a bad thing. They just relate it to bad stuff. But, but actually, like you just said, it, it's actually there for a reason. It's there to protect you. So it, it's yeah. an anti-inflammatory. So basically, if you are running away from that lion and it gets you, then it's just yeah. there to like calm the inflammation. Like if there's anything going on, um, releasing sugar into the blood. So you have more energy to get away. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's designed for you to survive. Yeah. Yeah. And it diverts blood away from your uh, stomach, your gastrointestinal area, you know, towards the limbs, towards the muscles. So you can run away, um, you know, help, helps you breathe better, dilates those blood vessels. So it is really good acutely. That's, that's the key word, you know, short term. Yeah, it's good. It can be really helpful for us. It can help us escape that lion or it can help us give that presentation or meet that deadline. But the thing, the issue is, you know, when we constantly have deadlines mm. or when we're just constantly stressed out for a long period of time, that's when we start to see issues. But overall cortisol, so it is secreted by the adrenal glands. And a lot of times when someone's stressed out, first the adrenals will secrete like, uh, you know, adrenaline. So adrenaline is immediate and adrenaline mm -hmm. helps us react very quickly. And is then that the cortisol... one that makes you shake. And that, that's the one that kind of makes like <laughs> yeah. the immediate kind of like, Ooh. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yep, yep. <laughs> uh, if you understand then... what I mean, when I say that, the... <laughs> oh, I do. Yeah. Oh, I do. I do. Yeah. Um, but then cortisol, it might take a few minutes, 10 minutes to start being secreted or produced, you know, after that initial adrenaline is produced, but in general, you know, even if we're not stressed out, we all have a cortisol or we should, you know, in healthy individuals, we should have this cortisol diurnal pattern and diurnal pattern just means that it's higher at certain times of the day and it's lower at, at other times of the day. And a normal cortisol diurnal pattern is where cortisol is at its lowest when we're sleeping, mm -hmm. you know, around midnight, it's its lowest, which makes mm -hmm. sense. You know, does, we don't want yeah. our don't heart racing. Like, yeah. We don't want a bunch of sugar in our blood when we're sleeping. Yeah. Um, and then it reaches its highest point about 30, 45 minutes, you know, an hour after we wake up. So that's its highest point. And then it'll decline throughout the day. So that's a normal pattern. Which makes sense because when you wake up, you want to have the energy to kind of get going, get on with your day. Um, yeah. rise you know get everything done and then as the day progresses then the cortisol comes down your um, you start to become more relaxed and I think you know just kind of changing the topic a bit that's when melatonin kicks in isn't it they kind of they they, they have an inverse relationship so yes. when cortisol starts to come down during the day that's when melatonin kicks in it starts to come up it starts to make you tired like that's the perfect pattern for a healthy person yes and Sometimes when people have high cortisol at night, you know, let's say they're up at night worrying about uh, some work event the next day, or they're up at night tapping on their computer, trying to mm. finish their work, uh, or maybe they're doing strenuous exercise at night before bed, mm -hmm. whatever it is, you know, if cortisol is elevated at night, cortisol will suppress melatonin production. Right. So it'll make they, it they've got to be inverse, difficult. right? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, okay. Typically they're, they're inverse and they both, I mean, melatonin and cortisol both affect blood sugar. So okay. you do want them to both be rising and falling at the correct times during the day, uh, not be too high, not be too low, just so you do have favorable impacts on your blood sugar. Okay. Because I, do you know what? I think so many people can relate to that because I was just talking to my neighbor um, a few days ago and she is a typical night owl like she when she um puts her child to bed she then works up until about nine or ten at night and my husband as well he is a night owl and he will come home relax a bit but then he'll be on his laptop until about 1am mm -hmm. and it's so so common um that people are just busier than ever in the evening when melatonin yeah. is supposed to be high and cortisol is supposed to be low 
Yep. So interesting you said about blood sugar. Um, so with cortisol, blood sugar gets chucked into the bloodstream for energy, but mm. then melatonin, is it the opposite? Melatonin, um, so I, I have to think about that a little bit more, but mm. I know in some people who have certain genetics where mm. they don't clear melatonin well, they if they take melatonin supplementation mm. every night, and they're not clearing their melatonin out, or they're not clearing that supplement out well because of certain genetic uh, variants that they have, um, it, it can increase blood sugar. Okay. And so I would think melatonin, if it's too high for too long, can lead to elevated blood sugar okay. too. Yeah. Okay. All right. That, that's another conversation then <laughs> about <Yeah>. sleep <laughs> and rest and rejuvenation. Oh, yeah. Um, so, so that's, that's a healthy cortisol pattern. It's necessary. It's, you know, f- perfectly healthy. But then with today's uh, modern woman who comes to you with um, all sorts of symptoms, um, what would you expect to see on mm-hmm. someone who's struggling with stress? Yeah. So that's a really good question. And it kind of depends on how long she's been struggling with stress. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, especially in the beginning, you'll see just very high cortisol. So maybe we'll run a Dutch test. We'll look at the cortisol. Uh, The Dutch test is nice because we're, we're looking at cortisol either in the urine or the saliva. Mm -hmm. So there's no blood draws involved. You know, there's no needle sticks, which could naturally be stressful. Yeah. And I think it does affect, affect cortisol results for some people, but we're looking at the cortisol and the urine and the saliva, and we can see the diurnal pattern because we're looking at the cortisol throughout the day. And for some women, when they're really stressed out, you know, maybe they um, are watching their children, but they also are working and they have all these events they're going to. Um, you know, they, they just have a lot on their plate, basically. So when people who are stressed out long term, you'll see, or not long term, but just stressed out, I would say more short term or more acutely, you'll see high cortisol mm-hmm. throughout the day. And right. sometimes you'll even see it high at night and they're having issues falling asleep because wow. they're not making melatonin, their cortisol is high, their body's more in this like fight or flight mode, sympathetic mm-hmm. dominance, we call it. Yeah. And so their body's more ready to get stuff done or to run away from the the, yeah. the lion, you know? And I can imagine, um, you know, also diet has a lot to do with that as well. So just say she's um, stressed out, she's got a lot on her plate, but then on top of that, she's drinking her coffee and she's having her pastry and, um, you yep. know, the, the kind of refined sugary foods and, you know, the things that we do to get by in the day um, that will also keep cortisol elevated right it can it can affect blood sugars which can affect cortisol um yeah that brings up a really good point about how diet plays into the whole mix Mm because it's true and a lot of times when we're stressed we're not sleeping well and there's research showing if you don't sleep well you tend to have more cravings you tend to eat more the next day so if if we've got high cortisol, which is causing our blood sugars to be all wonky all over the place, you know, that's going to cause cravings. That's going to cause us to eat more. But on top of that, if we're not sleeping, that's going to complicate the matter even more. Um, But if someone's been running around with high cortisol for a long time, I kind of see it as a protective mechanism from the body. So high cortisol for too long is not good. And the brain knows it, the body knows it. And so the brain is constantly monitoring cortisol in the bloodstream. And over time, when the brain sees that there's just chronically high cortisol, the brain's like, all right, this isn't sustainable. Uh, People call it like cortisol resistance. So Mm -hmm. the brain decides that the adrenals just shouldn't make as much cortisol. And so after a long period of high cortisol, we tend to see cortisol drop and it gets, gets low and people and stop sort of having like that when, when you pattern. see that on a Dutch test, you're like, okay, this is serious. This has been going on for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. When you see that low cortisol, exactly. Yeah. This is okay. What's, what's been stressing her out for, you know, probably months and months or years and years. Mm. Um, and, and when you have low cortisol, then you have a whole new, well, some of the issues are similar as high cortisol, but, um, comes with its own issues. Cause if you think about it, 
for especially for women, the adrenals, remember cortisol is made from the adrenals, but the adrenals for women, they're making a lot of our androgens and androgens are known as like male sex hormones, you know, like testosterone and DHEA and these, these androgens, they really help women with their bone health, with their focus, their cognition, their confidence, their energy levels, their ability to exercise and recover from exercise, libido, um, libido, yeah. ability to build muscle, their skin, their hair, you know, the androgens are very, very important. And if you're acutely stressed, so if you've got high cortisol and high adrenal output, a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times I'll see high androgens. And so women might have like symptoms of high androgens, like acne or mood issues or hair loss or facial hair growth. Um, but over time, the androgens tend to drop just like cortisol. And if we're stressed out long-term, our androgens tend to decline faster than they normally would as we age. Mm -hmm. So over time with low androgens, you see women not being able to exercise as well or recover or build that, that muscle mass or keep mm -hmm. muscle mass on. And I can imagine, so if, if, if just say you've been chronically stressed for months and months or years and years, and your cortisol is flat, your androgens are flat, uh, in general, you're turning up every day and you're just feeling pretty flat. Like just, you just yeah. don't have the same zest for life that you had before. And, you know, you're not recovering well, like you said, and um, fatigue and um, just, just life is probably feeling a bit dull, you know, at that point, surely. Yeah. I think for some people that's their experience and you can definitely have a lot of fatigue with that. And, you know, we know with chronic stress, it does affect our cortisol. It does affect our blood sugar. Um, you know, it, it does it affects a lot of things. So if you think about, so we, for our nervous system, I think this is always, this is important to talk about yeah. for our nervous, I love system, the nervous we system. have, go into it. Go on. <laughs> we have this sym sympathetic mm -hmm. nervous system. That's our fight or flight. And then we have the parasympathetic, which we call rest and digest. So when we're stressed out, we typically are in the sympathetic mode. And even if we have low cortisol, we can still be in the sympathetic mode. And the sympathetic mode is when we're, you know, running away from that lion, when we're getting more, trying to get more sugar in the bloodstream, mm -hmm. when we're diverting blood flow away from the intestines, you know, more towards or away from the digestive organs and more mm -hmm. towards the muscles so that we can run. Um, you know, it's anti-inflammatory. So a lot of times immune system is suppressed and with long-term stress, or if we're in the sympathetic mode to, for too long, then that means we're not in the parasympathetic mode enough. And the parasympathetic mode, that's our rest and digest. That's when we heal. That's when we grow, when we build or rebuild. That's when we digest. Um, so if we're in that sympathetic mode, a lot of times we have chronic GI, gastrointestinal symptoms, urinary disorders. Mm -hmm. So maybe we have more constipation, maybe we have more diarrhea, um, gas, bloating. Uh, when we're in that sympathetic mode too often, a lot of times we're fatigued or we start running into even cardiovascular issues and heart attacks. Um, mm -hmm. We can have issues with our immune system, you know, immune dysfunction, maybe even autoimmunity. And of course, blood sugar issues, like chronically high cortisol tends to lead to insulin resistance. And so women start having a lot of issues with weight gain and it's hard for them to lose that weight too. Yeah. I think that was an important thing I wanted to go into because like you said at the beginning, it's, it's almost celebrated to be working hard and to have lots going on in your life. I mean, when I, when I think about this, I think my, my, my sister, um, she comes to mind because she's, she, no one works harder than my sister. Like she is a grafter. She mm -hmm. is always busy. She's got two kids. Um, she works full time. Um, she looks after the household. Like she is your classic modern woman, like go, go, go type a personality. Um, and whenever she comes to me and she says, I'm like, oh, how are you doing? She's like, oh, I'm just, I'm so stressed. Like I've got so much going on. And I'm like, oh, you know, that's a shame. We should get some rest, but well done. 
like mm-hmm. I even I'm guilty of saying oh, yeah. well done like you things must be going well though like it's it's almost like you relate <laughs> you relate <Yeah. laughs> you relate being productive and busy like you, you almost celebrate that person because you're like wow you, you you can do so much like you're so able like well done congratulations um mm-hmm. so so be, because that is so ingrained in us if there's anything that's gonna have women realize that oh shoot like maybe I should really do something about my stress um that is to know obviously that it's not good for your health and it could lead Mm. to pretty much any disease under the sun right Mm. um but then also could stress be making you gain weight or could stress be the reason why you're not losing weight and that's the mechanism that you've just said the way that cortisol dumps sugar into the bloodstream insulin comes in like full force um the cells get sick and tired of insulin after a period of time then they shut their doors and they say go away insulin I'm done with you like you're always bothering me putting sugar into (laughs) yeah I don't want anymore (laughs) I don't want anymore so that's that's when your cells become insulin resistant so that's when your blood is full of sugar and full of insulin and then that's the that's the issue right that's where the weight gain comes in yeah yeah so um because all that sugar you know yeah. where is it gonna go it's gonna be stored as fat right right yep. and a lot of times when women have insulin resistance that means that as you said the cells are not responding to the insulin anymore mm. and so insulin you know the body has to make even more insulin to try to increase that signaling or kind of shout to the cells like, Hey cells, I'm serious. Now I've got more insulin. You really have to take this sugar that's in the blood and put it in the cell. Right. Um, so with the insulin resistance, when the, when the cells are like not listening to insulin, no, we don't want to take sugar in, um, you know, then those cells aren't making as much ATP or energy from the sugar. And so with insulin resistance, it's, it's odd, but people start like they're internally in their cells. It's like, they're starving. They don't have mm-hmm. that sugar in their cells and they start feeling really depleted. And what happens is a lot of people are really tired, so they don't want to exercise. Mm-hmm. Right. But exercise will actually help increase insulin sensitivity. Mm-hmm. It'll help those cells listen to insulin better. So exercise is actually really important, but we're so tired that we don't want to exercise. And then on top of that, we just, we eat sweets and we eat processed foods just to help get us through the day. And those sweets, those processed foods, the cravings, you know, that's going to help us gain more weight. And we're going to lose muscle over time because naturally as we age, especially when we hit 35, our androgens really start to decline. Remember we were talking about androgens are important for maintaining muscle mass. Yeah. So with our, our androgens declining over time and with that insulin resistance, going up and we're not exercising. We're eating more, more, uh, I don't know, little treats and lattes. And just to get us through the day, um, we start to gain weight and it makes it, it's really difficult to lose that weight Mm -hmm. because when we're in that state, we have, we call it poor metabolic flexibility and metabolic flexibility is our ability to switch from burning glucose to burning fat. And when we're in that state, we're always burning glucose Mm -hmm. from the, from the sugared latte, from the donut, from the pasta, you know, we're not moving over to burning that fat that we've stored. Mm -hmm. And the, the fat, um, to add insult to injury, it collects in like the worst area. It does. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's, it's true. And with, with cortisol, you'll see cortisol does it look at Cushing's disease or mm-hmm. Cushing syndrome. So in Cushing's disease, we have just way, way too much cortisol because the adrenals are like overproducing cortisol. Um, it's like an actual um, diagnosable disease where the adrenals overproduce cortisol. But in, anyways, with the high cortisol, what do you see? What's like, what's typical in a patient with Cushing's, their arms, their legs get really thin, but all the weight goes to the middle. And that's exactly what cortisol and stress does. It takes your weight or your fat and it mobilizes it and moves it to the middle, to the viscera, which 
is not the best because that tends to be where it's more inflammatory. So it's, now we're having more inflammation in our body. It's going to be even more difficult to lose weight. Mm-hmm. Um, I heard something really interesting the other day. Someone put it in a really interesting way. So even if somebody isn't eating sugary foods, even if just say their diet is perfect, but then they have high stress, that the, the way that that cortisol behaves by by pouring sugar into the bloodstream it's like you're having a cupcake like and and if you're you know putting sugar into the bloodstream all day like high cortisol levels all day then mm-hmm. it's like you're eating several cupcakes like even if your diet is on point so i i think what the overall kind of takeaway from this section is if you have a lot on your plate if you're highly stressed Um, if you're starting to see symptoms like fatigue, or if you're just, you're not feeling yourself, um, you're starting to gain weight and you don't know why. I mean, I know that we'll get onto the life stages of women soon. Um, there, there is a natural stage at which you do tend to gain more weight because the Mm -hmm. hormones change, but, um, just say, you know, you gain, you're gaining weight and you're finding it difficult to lose and you just don't understand what's going on. You're confused. You can't exercise. You don't have the energy. If you're in that state then it could all be coming down to the fact that like you need to rest you just need to <laughs> <Yes>. rest yeah <laughs> like just do that thing like just rest and you know find time to relax and mm-hmm. um, how long do you think it takes for someone to kind of reverse that so if someone was like okay so I'm gonna start to relax a bit more because I think this is me mm-hmm. um how long do you think it would take if someone was to start to bring relaxation into their lives um yeah. does it is, does it take months does it take years it what takes months reckon? months to years months to years it, it yeah, depends depending. on the health the health of the person already mm-hmm. their willingness to make those changes the mm-hmm. degree to which they make those changes Um, you know, are they going to prioritize rest over work? You know, how, how much of that rest are they going to bring into their, their life? How much are they going to get into that parasympathetic rest and digest state? Mm. So I see it taking, some people bounce back pretty quickly, you know, it takes months, but for some people, it really does take, take a while. It can take years. Okay. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a commitment. You've, you've got to commit to this and you've got to stick with it. Basically you've got to see the results. Yeah. Yeah. And we got to start doing it now because as yes. we get older, it just gets harder. It gets harder to bounce back because we just kind of get in that cycle. We get deeper and deeper into that cycle. Mm-hmm. Um, cause if you think about it, like as we're losing muscle mass, mm-hmm. muscles, like mus- the muscle mass, you know, you know, they say muscle burns more than fat. Mm-hmm. So when we're building muscle mass, just at, just at a sitting, like me here sitting, if I have more muscle, I'm going to be burning more calories per mm-hmm. minute just because I have more muscle. Yeah. So as we're getting older, as our androgens are declining, and if they're declining faster, because we're stressed out, you know, we, we're not burning as many calories at rest, but muscle has a big impact on our blood sugar and our insulin sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So when we start to lose muscle mass, our insulin resistance goes up. I mean, I like to think of um, muscles, they're like sinks for glucose. It's like when, when you start training them, like even, even a long walk is, is getting the muscles working. Like we're not talking um, I mean, obviously lifting weights is brilliant if you can do that going into older mm-hmm. age, but then um, even just having a walk uh, gets the large muscles in your legs working, which um, kind of makes them more sensitive to insulin, which allows mm-hmm. the sugar to drain out of your bloodstream. And that's the like glucose sinks. I like to think of it as, um, and like you said, like the muscle, it's so important to keep it, um, keep them dense, healthy, you know, thick kind of going into old age because they decline mm. over time um did, was there anything else you wanted to say on muscle I saw you were going to say something I don't know if you, you were you could tell <laughs> <laughs> you were like you're about to go on to something exciting and then I can't go oh on. I'm sorry I don't know if it's I don't know if it's that exciting but well for you it, was, say, it looked like it you know, was you were like... <laughs> well, maybe to me it is um you know muscle mass it helps with insulin sensitivity it helps us lose weight it helps us burn more calories at rest um, but it's also going to help with our bone health and over time, osteopenia, osteoporosis becomes a really 
you know, significant issue for a lot of us as we get older. Mm -hmm. So maintaining that muscle mass, and there's really no way to maintain muscle mass if you're not working out as we get older. So Mm -hmm. exercise gets even more important. You know, a lot of times I feel like we're playing in our twenties and our thirties, and then we start hitting our (laughs) twenties. And it's like a huge wake up call for so many people. Like, Oh, okay. I really I'm not superhuman. <laughs> yeah. I, can't. I don't, I don't. And it's because we, we lose that metabolic flexibility. We, we lose that ability to switch from burning glucose to fats really easily. And so, uh, we have to put more effort into our health in order to continue feeling good and to prevent osteoporosis and cardiovascular d- disease and fatigue and GI disorders and immune issues. I mean, I that one of my favorite things um, is I like to, to to get people's attention about muscle is I like to say, what does your ass say about you? So basically, because <laughs> your glu- <laughs> the muscles in your glutes, your gluteus maximus, it's like the biggest muscle in your body. Uh-huh. And, you know, when you're young, you're, you're kind of, you've got the curves, you've got the bum. But then as you get older, like a lot of us kind of lose that. We lose that muscular shape and including yes. the bum like the bum kind of shrinks over time so um I, I like to kind of say that to people it's like you know what is your ass saying like if you're if your butt is shrinking over time that's a good indication that your muscle mass overall like in your body um it needs some attention you know just oh my gosh it really yes. built up because it's like the biggest muscle in your body like wow. just get to work that really it. hits home it does, I'm going right? to lift, I'm going to lift some weights today. Yeah. I mean, after a year ago, after I had my first baby, I have no ass now it's completely gone. So it's go. a very, it's a good motivator. I'm always thinking, okay, <laughs> got to build this back up again, especially before I have the next baby. I refuse to have another baby until I'm like back in shape. I've got my ass back. Cause you know, you, you got to go back into pregnancy healthy, right? Yeah. Right. And, and you know what? You're not alone because my ass has gone as well. Like I yeah. have not been training properly <laughs> for like months because I've been so like in keeping with the conversation, I've been so busy, like just, I've yeah. got too much to do like I can't hit the gym but my ass is saying Tam get to the gym like I'm shrinking here so right. yeah we're being honest here we can we can motivate each other we'll just like send, send each other text messages have you yeah instead <laughs> what, of pictures your... of our kids yeah <laughs> pictures of yeah. our ass <laughs> yeah what's your ass saying today <laughs> I like that but anyway I hope people are motivated by that I'm glad I'm glad that that's kind of motivated to you as well but um I mean, this kind of takes us into um, stress for females and mm-hmm. how it affects her in different stages of life because she, uh, she's got so many stages. Like a man just kind of like has one phase. No, he has, okay, so he has two. Like he has, he's a child and then he's a man, like done. But, <laughs> what but about they andro- do have pause. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like the, the men opause. Um, okay, yeah. so yeah. But females, obviously, we're so much more complicated hormonally and mm-hmm. um, we have uh, very distinct stages. Um, we have the fertile years, we have perimenopause, and then we have menopause. And they're never black and white either. It takes years to build up to each one. And this is what I'm saying to women in their 30s. I'm just like, okay, so the 20s were fun, like we said. Mm-hmm. But yeah. <laughs> like, let's, let's agree on that. The, the 20s were fun. But um, when it gets to your 30s, um, don't think that you're still like, yeah, I can do whatever I want because your body is preparing for perimenopause and how mm-hmm. you live your 30s will very likely um, kind of impact how you experience perimenopause. So stress kind of comes into that. So how does stress affect high stress affect a woman in her fertile years, um, perimenopause, and then going into menopause? Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So high stress can affect women similarly through all stages of life. There's some symptoms and signs that overlap, but in during the fertile year, years, of course, high stress can shut down the brain's communication to the ovaries. Because basically when we're under a lot of stress, our brain is wise and it's like, oh wow, okay, we're, we're uh, super stressed out. There's a lot going on. Let's not have a baby right now. 
Like we are already expending so much energy, so many resources. We just don't have that energy or resources to be pregnant right now, to bring a child into this world, to breastfeed. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a big uh, commitment for a, a child. So when we're in our fertile years and we're stressed out, a lot of times women will have irregular cycles or they'll have amenorrhea. So they just stop getting their period. Um, I, I remember this takes me back to a time when I lost, um, I, I was basically grieving the loss of someone close to me and I lost my period for a few months. And so that's literally, yeah. that's exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Even, yeah. Stressors can definitely affect menses. Um, a lot of things, yeah, a lot of different stressors can affect menses. I, I had a friend who lost a loved one and she said, yeah, I, I'm always clockwork. I always get it on this certain day, day 30 or whatever it was. And she said, when I lost a family member, it was a week late. Mm. So it does, it does change. And I know my most stressful year was my residency year. Mm. And usually I'm pretty regular, but I, my menses were, I mean, my cycle, my overall cycle length was anywhere from 15 to 45 days like I never knew when my period was going to come <laughs> wow oh my gosh so it you was to be ready with your tampon <laughs> like yeah, everywhere right? you went it was like, could like be surprise today. <laughs> surprise you, you just stopped bleeding seven days ago and we're back yeah it, it wasn't a good oh. it was not a good time uh, but of course with high stress even fertile women can have uh, fatigue you know, they can have issues with weight loss. They can have issues with their hormones, their estrogen, their androgens. So they, they can have um, all, I mean, you know, stress can cause all sorts of issues. Mm -hmm. uh, but perimenopause, so perimenopause is that transition time mm -hmm. from, you know, when we're younger, we're cycling, we're fertile, we're having babies, moving over to menopause where mm -hmm. we no longer cycle. So perimenopause is that transition period. It can be anywhere from like 10 to 12 years before menopause, 10 to 15 years before menopause. So if the average age of menopause is 51. Mm. So some, some women are in perimenopause in their early forties, you know, and it's, it's true. Like if we're more metabolically flexible, if we're healthier, we've been taking care of ourselves a lot of times these women won't have as many issues in perimenopause and menopause. Like they'll feel pretty good. They won't gain that much weight. They won't have as many hot flashes. They won't have as many mood swings, um, issues with insomnia. Uh, but in perimenopause, when we get stressed out, we just tend to have more of those mm -hmm. symptoms. Um, we tend to gain more weight. We tend to have more issues falling asleep at night or staying asleep at night. Um, more, more mood issues. I think I already said that one, but yeah, you, you tend to have a, a lot more symptoms in perimenopause. And then when you hit menopause, so menopause is defined as going without a period for 12 months. Mm -hmm. So for a year, you just haven't had a period and we say, okay, you're in menopause and in women who are stressed out and they hit menopause, it's, it's tough. Cause on top of the stress, they also have their estrogen and their progesterone just declining majorly because the ovaries are no longer making estrogen. They're no, no longer ovulating. They're no longer making progesterone. Mm -hmm. And we know that estrogen and progesterone in the right balance is really important for, for our blood sugar regulation and so mental when, health, right? And, like, and mental health. That's why they feel like, I just don't feel like myself. I feel like I can't cope anymore. So yep. that the, the hormones, like the hormones have dropped. Yeah. yeah estrogen, um, progesterone, androgens. I mean, our sex hormones really do affect neurotransmitter levels, uh, the clearance of neurotransmitters from our body. So when our sex hormone levels decline or when they fluctuate, people definitely see an issue with, with mood and you'll see it. I mean, all over the world, when you look at suicide rates, they're, they're high around perimenopause. Like between 45, 55, um, sometimes it's the age group that has the highest rate of suicide. Sometimes it's like just second to kind of the teen years, but um, it's definitely a, a, a very significant issue is mood in wow. perimenopause and menopause. Wow. 
Um, so, I mean, you said before, going into perimenopause, going into menopause, it's it's a lot harder if your metabolism, if you're not very metabolically flexible. So mm -hmm. when you said going for your body's ability to switch from using glue sugar for energy yep. and, and fat for energy, like you should be able to do that really easily day to day. But um, yeah. modern day women, if you're stressed or if you have a bad diet um, with lots of processed carbohydrates and lots of sugars, um, it's your body becomes less flexible and it, it gets used to using sugar for energy mm -hmm. and not so much the fat, which can lead to weight gain and all that. But so you're saying if someone becomes more metabolically flexible, then their perimenopausal years will become easier. Usually. Yes. That's, okay. what, that's what we see. Yep. Okay. That's uh, across the board, not even just for weight and energy, okay. like for hot flashes, for sleep, for mood. And you tend to see that when people are metabolically flexible uh, regarding mood, their mood is more even. They don't have these like wild elevations and dips in their blood sugar yeah. that's setting them up to get in a fight with their partner or, uh, you know, just to, 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 not, to not feel well or, or to feel like, oh, I need that chocolate or I need that pastry or that caffeinated sugary latte just to get me through the day for like on a mental, emotional level. Because um, I, I with my perimenopausal clients, um, the, the big tips are, you know, reduce your stress, um, reduce your sugar intake, um, take out alcohol, reduce caffeine, basically all the things that can raise your blood sugar levels mm -hmm. um, just to kind of make it easier. And, and the results are always quite miraculous and they, they, they see improvements um, in their symptoms within weeks sometimes like yeah. suddenly they don't have hot flashes they're like okay I, I didn't have one like this is amazing so yeah. it's, it's really incredible how much your body wants to be healthy it wants to be metabolically flexible like it's always working in your favor you've just got to create the right environment eat the right foods um you know, that it's no secret what the right foods are you know everyone kind of knows eat whole foods yeah. and you know <laughs> Um, keep that the processed foods as minimal as possible but then also what this topic is about is stress like it is it is it's, it's celebrated but it's um it's not good like it, this these are the problems that it's causing and mm. just people need to and I need to take it more seriously I mean how what, what's your view on stress for yourself like how do you feel are you in a stressful place at the moment you said you're feeling a bit better these days but yeah. Um, like how are things on your side? Yeah. I mean, in school, I was very stressed when I was getting my naturopathic med medical degree. There were some days when I had 13 hour days and just one hour break. So I was either in class or I was in clinic seeing patients. It was very stressful and I was overly scheduled. I remember I, I didn't have any time to get an oil change and I was going like months and months and months overdue. I think I went like a year over. What's an oil change? <laughs> an oil change on my car. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, do, do humans have oil changes? Like, is that something yeah, I need to I know. know in the doctor world? Like, <laughs> no, I hope not, because I would be very overdue with that one. No, but it, I was so busy, and then my residency, I got even busier. And like I said, my cycles were super irregular. All of my issues came back. I got headaches again. I was tired again. All of my GI issues came back. My anxiety was bad. I was having dizzy spells. It was terrible. Um, and then I used to try to open up my own practice, which was also stressful. And uh, I decided, I was like, you know what? I really need work-life balance because for me, when I was seeing patients in person, I would come home angry, not at the patients, but I come home angry because I still had so much work to do. I had charts to finish. I had to call the pharmacy, call in prescriptions. I had to respond to emails and I was just at doing too much basically. And for my own decision, it, and it was hard. It was hard because I went to school to be a doctor, to see patients. And that's what all my friends and family expected of me. And I decided, you know, oh, I, you know, there's this lab precision analytical who I work for now. Mm. They're wonderful. They're very research-based. Um, I could work for them from home full-time and talk to providers about their patients' test results. And it took me a long time, I mean, relatively long, a few months to build up the courage to even tell my parents that I wasn't going to see patients anymore because wow. I just wanted that work-life 
balance. I wanted to lower stress. And when I, after I made that switch, oh my gosh, it was so different. Like at night at four or five o'clock when I was done for the day, I shut down my computer and that was it. I was done. So I, I think when it comes to lowering stress, there's sacrifices, mm-hmm. you know, whenever you make a change, you're giving up something, but I think lowering stress comes with a lot of, um, realizations and hard decisions, but you really have to go into it with, with self-love mm-hmm. and, uh, yeah, do it for you. Cause mm-hmm. even if you're stressed out, you're doing things for everyone else. When you realize that when you're whole as a person, when you're happy, you're going to, you're going to be such a better mom. You're going to be such a better spouse. You're going to be such a better daughter or, you know, it's a friend. So, um, I always think about, you know, when you're on the airplane and they say, put that oxygen mask on yourself first, right? There's, there's a reason you do that. Um, and so making those hard decisions, a lot of times it's, it's, it's own, your own expectations on yourself. Right. Um, and yeah, maybe you have external expectations, but people get over it. They have to, it's not their life. It's your life. So you make those decisions for yourself. Uh, sometimes it's a financial issue though. You know, it's hard. So, but you know, doing a lot of brainstorming and coming up with other creative ways to bring in money. I mean, there's always another way to do it. Mm-hmm. That's kind of how I see it. Sometimes we feel very backed in a corner. This is how it is. I can't, can't give up this or this commitment, but really you can, Yeah. you know, yep. there's you always can, a way. you can have a, 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 less luxurious lifestyle Mm -hmm. and not have to work as much, or you can refinance, you know, learn more about financial issues. I had a, a friend whose parents were in debt. They had a lot of credit card debt. They didn't understand the financial situation. And then, you know, they had five jobs between the two of them Mm -hmm. and they were working constantly and they weren't making enough money to pay off their credit card, the interest on their credit cards. So they were just like going in this perpetual hole and, um, you know, he helped them out. He figured it out. He refinanced everything and now they have a house, they own a house. So Mm -hmm. there's a lot we can do. A lot of it comes with education and Mm self-love. Sorry, that was long, but that's, no, no. I mean, (laughs) you hit on some really good points there. So first of all, when you said, you know, explaining what you've sacrificed to other people, and I think what you'll also find is they they just want the best for you as well. Like, mm-hmm. so even though if it's scary to admit something, admit that you're giving something up or, you know, you're dropping something out of your life and, you know, you have to tell people about it, they don't really like, they, they want the best for you. Like, you know, so don't think about what other people think. It's, you know, they're, they're going to yeah. want the best for you anyway. And they probably, some people don't care as much as you think as well. So. <laughs> yeah. I feel like it's always much worse in your head, isn't it? You always create <laughs> yeah. this picture in your head of like what everyone thinks and like this little planet in your head of how things right. are, but really it's not always the case. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's really important that we kind of find ways to overcome stress. And at, towards the end of the conversation, I definitely want the best tips that you have on managing stress, like in supplements and everything. But before we kind of Um, kind of touch on that and because we're talking about metabolic flexibility um, I just wanted to um, kind of drop in fasting here it's a bit of a um, it's kind of dropped in from nowhere but um, (laughs) but for my fasting ladies who who are listening um, I wanted to talk about intermittent fasting because it's um, it's a tricky one to discuss in females because it's kind of a lot of the fasting research, a lot of the ketogenic research, um, it's, it's kind of done on males mm-hmm. because, um, a lot of research isn't, um, isn't done on females in their reproductive years. Right. Because it's just too risky. Yeah. It's, it's hard. It's, I mean, males, you think about it, their hormones are pretty much mm. stable, but females, we've got our estrogen, our progesterone fluctuating, our yeah. metabolism is very mm. different at yeah. different types of times of our cycle. So when you design a research study, it's just easier to do it on okay. men. 
Okay, that that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so so intermittent fasting for women, there's a lot of criticism. There's a lot of there's a lot of um, positive things out there, but then there's also a lot of criticism about it. Like women mm. shouldn't be fasting because um, you know our hormones are more delicate and we're more um, susceptible to cortisol, um, which intermittent fasting can increase. Um, so I just wanted your um, opinion on intermittent fasting. So you're very welcome to go into the good parts and the bad parts, the parts that you think um, women, that the women that you think should be intermittent fasting and the women who you think should be avoiding it. So just tell me what you think, intermittent fasting for women. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it, it's true that men can do the keto diet, men can intermittent fast. Right. Uh, just more often, mm. uh, to a greater degree, get their and results quicker. They get their results <laughs> quick. <laughs> Darn it! Um, <laughs> then, then women, it's it's because we do have these fluctuating hormones that um, do change our metabolism. You know, our ability to sleep, the amount that we can exercise. You know, during different times of our cycle, mm-hmm. and for for some women, intermittent fasting is just a no go not always, not forever, but Mm -hmm. for their current situation. So these are the women who have really low cortisol Mm -hmm. or maybe even really high cortisol. So So very stressed women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Extreme amount of stress. We, you know, intermittent fasting is another stressor on the body. So Mm -hmm. we don't want to introduce that, but that doesn't mean they can never intermittent fast, Mm -hmm. you know, when they get their stress under control and they support those adrenal glands you know, then eventually it becomes more doable for them. And, and these women will know, like the women who have a lot of stressors on their body, when they try to intermittent fast, it doesn't work. Yeah. It's, I, I've been there. Yeah. Been there. yeah. <laughs> like, you just have a lot of symptoms. It doesn't yes. feel good. Yes. yes. I've been um, there. Like, yeah, totally. Mm. Yeah. The women where it works, they're, they're, um, you know, a lot of times intermittent fasting will decrease their hunger and decrease mm. their cravings and they'll feel better on it. Exactly. But in general, intermittent fasting, women can do more of it in their follicular phase. And that's around the, you know, first week or two of their cycle. So when they get their period, that's when their cycle begins. Mm-hmm. So kind of like when they get their period, the week or two after that, that's when they have more of that flexibility to fast. Um, that's when they can lower their carb intake. Mm. Uh, that's when they can exercise more vigorously. But as they get towards their next period, mm. you know, like a week before their next period, women might think more about resting more, about um, not limiting carbs as much and lowering the exercise and, and maybe not fasting or doing a very gentle mm. <laughs> type fast. And um, I mean, what you're saying is just brilliant because our body tells us that as well. You know, it, it, we all know that before our period, that's when things get a bit wonky. You know, we, yeah. we start to feel a bit kind of, I, that's when we start to question our life. We're like, where am I going? What am I doing with my life? <laughs> like, yeah. um, <laughs> um, you know, you, you start to, um, you know, feel more irritable and that's when cravings kick in for a lot of women. Like that's mm-hmm. when carbohydrate needs start to increase. And, and basically what you're saying is that's because that's what your body wants. Like your body wants um, uh, just more carbs at that time. And basically what you're also saying is when you're actually on your period, and um maybe the week after as well like the first yeah yeah um you're kind of that's when you can be wonder woman (laughs) yeah that's that's when you can be like I'm gonna do longer fasts I'm gonna exercise I'm gonna you know try all these new things and that's also you know um your mood improves as well like you know the the first day of your period that's when you feel like oh it's like the relief right that relief oh it's like mm. instant, isn't it? Yeah. It's, you can just feel it. Um, as soon as you've started, you're just like, oh God, well, that, I don't need to quit my job. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, you know, leading up to um, kind of ovulation, that's when you're feeling like really flirtatious and you're just like, yeah, I'm just going to put on my red lipstick and I'm just going to do my hair really nice today. And so right. like at that, that time, um, 
is is a really lovely time like and and that's when you can be like more outgoing and more kind of like um, experimental more vivacious with your lifestyle and but then you know there's that natural decline in energy and like that more that that need to kind of become more introverted and to just eat more carbs and you know just to kind of nurse yourself um happens Mm -hmm. towards the end of the cycle so it just it just makes um really good sense but um, what, what you said was really good because you said the women who should avoid fasting are the ones who already have um, high cortisol throughout the day or low cortisol. So basically all of the women who are totally stressed out. And I'm so glad you said that because what I'm always teaching my fasting ladies is um, when it comes to the longer fast, so let's say 16 hours plus, mm-hmm. um, you should really look at your life and think okay so how how are my stress levels um do am I training hard for like a marathon or something like and I start to get them to think about all of the stresses in their life like exercise um emotional stress physical stress um uh just all of the different stresses that we that we have in the day and just to kind of think okay so if fasting is an extra stress do I really want to be compounding them and put kind of putting them all together? Um, and the answer is no. So if you feel like you've got too much going on, then maybe just kind of come away from the the longer fasts and just stick to kind of 12, 12 or like even 14, 10, just to kind of, you know, um, so that you have time to recover and you mm. don't have to have that much stress. Um, but what I do love about the, intermittent fasting and and why it was so it came in so fluidly was because when you mentioned metabolic flexibility fasting gets in there like it's a really good way to get your body switching from glucose to fats and becoming Mm -hmm. metabolically flexible um so that's that's why I thought it was a really nice time to kind of drop that in but um so yeah I mean, do you have any other comments on that? Or, I mean, actually, that leads me into, um, so when it comes to the stresses in life, like the typical A-type personalities, um, the women who have loads of things going on, fasting, keto, HIIT training, calorie counting, coffee, um, all of those things. When is it okay to do those? And when is it not okay? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> those are big questions like even caffeine people are like is coffee good for you or not and yeah so what what's your feedback on that um I would say like a lot of times I like to look at the cortisol mm. and especially if they have low cortisol it's a flat line they don't have that diurnal rhythm mm. then I start thinking okay let's not do that hit training too much mm-hmm. maybe let's hold off on fasting for now <laughs> You know, yeah. I don't think your body's ready. We got to work with the adrenals and your stress first. Yeah. Um, I think low cortisol is probably worse than high cortisol when it comes to ability to fast and do keto and all of that. Like if it's really low cortisol, I'm kind of like, no, no way. If, it, if it's higher cortisol, I think people can still fit some of those in. Mm-hmm. Cause I think sometimes exercise in moderation is really good for our stress Cause, levels cause overall. It, um... it can help lower cortisol. I mean, just a quick question. When cortisol is high in your Mm. body, whether naturally or through stress, is that a good time to exercise? Because then you use the cortisol up. Like, does it work like that? And that's, that's a, that's a good question. I would say exercise is helpful, um, but not vigorous, not weight, like not really vigorous exercise. Cause we know that vigorous exercise is going to increase cortisol even more. Mm. So a lot of times that's when I'm thinking about like when, when there's HPA access dysfunction in general, which basically that means like when the adrenals aren't working optimally, you know, when cortisol isn't optimal in general, that's when I'm thinking of more kind of mm, gentle exercise or, uh, you know, yoga, walking, swimming. I mean, I know yoga and swimming can be really vigorous, yeah, but, but, but not going to that extreme. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And then over no CrossFit, time, basically, yeah, no, no CrossFit seven <laughs> no CrossFit. days a week. <laughs> um, but over time, you know, as people work on their stressors, as people support their adrenals, as they start getting the appropriate nutrition for their body, you know, then they can, they can push their body a little bit more 
with mm. this more vigorous exercise, with um, fasting, with, I mean, maybe not more coffee. I feel like just coffee, having a, like, a lot of, a lot of yeah. coffee, it's probably yeah. not good for anyone. Yeah. Like too much. It's just cause that just raises your adrenaline and your cortisol. Like that just kind of, right. It, it yeah. takes your cortisol up as well as it, your adrenaline. It can, mm. I think it does depend on how much you're drinking and what you're putting in your coffee. Mm. But some people, if they have one cup of black coffee without anything added to it, no sugar, no creamer, um, it might not affect their cortisol that much. So for, for some people, I think a little coffee is okay. And I do think it depends on genetics too. Genetics play into how we react to coffee, how we're able to detox coffee. Like I I don't even have to do a genetic test to know that coffee is not right for me. Mm. (laughs) Even if I have a little bit, I'm like, oh, (laughs) so anxious. And I, and I shake, like I'll hold my hand up and I'm like, okay. (laughs) <laughs> this is interesting okay yeah um okay, my husband's I, the same yeah, yeah yeah my husband's the same he he stays away from it he's decaf all the way yeah 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 so I think some people coffee is not good other people a little bit of coffee could be good mm. and that kind of explains why the feedback on coffee is so mixed out there it's hard to get a, a good answer as to whether coffee is good for you yeah. or not because it really just depends on genetics yeah. lifestyle like how you're feeling that day like it just has a lot to do with that so um I mean so I like I guess this kind of leads to um you know a woman who's stressed out and she's realized that she is and she's got all of these kind of symptoms fatigue flatness and you know jitteriness let's say um she's not feeling great so what sort of steps can she start to take like what are your best tips on lifestyle um food supplements like what are your go-tos for Mm -hmm. someone if they were to make a change today what would you recommend yeah one thing that I think you prioritize I think we've talked about this is sleep Mm. sleep oh my gosh um they always say sleep well I guess it's more in relation to um to the the burst of cortisol that we get when we wake up but if there's any dysfunction in that burst of cortisol that we have when we wake up they always say like sleep can fix 50 percent of those dysfunctions so sleep is so important for adrenals uh, when we're sleeping we're in that parasympathetic mode you know the rest and digest mode yeah. so it helps our body detox uh, you know our brain detoxes during sleep mm. our central nervous system detoxes when we sleep Um, But it's also, you know, a time when we're just laying there and we can't be scheduled because we just, we can't really do anything. So uh, like prior, like really prioritizing sleep. And I've talked to a few new moms who kind of gawk at the idea or laugh, like sleep when your baby sleeps. And I laugh a little too, Mm -hmm. because, you know, it can be really hard to do that, but it's kind of (laughs) true. Like when, when, you know, when you put your baby down, like go to sleep a lot of women say that's the only time I have for myself Mm. or me and my partner to stay up and we watch TV together or, you know, whatever. And, um, I think that is important, but, but not staying up till 11 every single night, Mm. you know, like, like trying to get to bed at at nine, Mm. you know, they, they say those hours before midnight are worth double than the hours after midnight. So going to bed early is important. There is something to this circadian rhythm we have, and going to bed when the sun goes down. So sleep is number one, Mm -hmm. but other things people do, there's some supplements out there, you know, like there's some calming and we call them adaptogenic herbs for the HPA axis for the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Mm -hmm. Cause the adrenals they're, they're, uh, they're not like floating around on their own. You know, the, the brain is communicating with the adrenals constantly. Mm -hmm. So these herbs work on optimizing that communication with the brain and the adrenals to, to improve cortisol, but some soothing adaptogenic herbs. I like ashwagandha, holy basil. Yeah. And we have herbs called nervines who, you know, these herbs work on calming the central nervous system. So that's like passion flower, valerian, uh, lemon balm can be helpful. Even uh, med- chamomile. Medicinal, medicinal mushrooms, would you agree? Med- medicinal mushrooms. Yeah. I think they can, yeah. Like lion's mane or um, like reishi or something like that. Yeah. 
Yeah, those can be helpful. I just keep in mind that reishi is a 5-alpha reductase right. blocker. Oxial. Okay. So if I already have someone with low androgens, like low testosterone, low DHEA, I might shy away from reishi in particular. I might do more like lion's mane or cordyceps. Cordyceps is a beautiful adaptogen. Um, But yeah, some of these nervine nerves, the chamomile can be really helpful. And chamomile is great when people have high androgens. Mm -hmm. Chamomile in the research. Yeah, it's been been uh, shown to help lower these androgens and chamomile is great for the digestive system. It's very calming. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a great one. Um, And there's some amino acid therapies like L-theanine can be super calming for people. Uh, Even taking GABA. Mm. So GABA can be really calming for people. So sometimes these supplements are helpful. Um, They can aid us with calming down our nervous system supporting our nervous system, supporting our adrenals. Mm -hmm. But I feel like, you know, they say you can never out supplement a bad lifestyle. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I I think it, it, what it comes down to, I mean, like you said, number one sleep. Um, So any of the ladies, I've, I've definitely had clients in the past who just can't quite get to bed early. Like they just, they can't quite do it, but it's so important like you have to find a way you have to find a way because that could be one of the roots of all of the problems that you're coming to me with so I think sleep is so important um what what are your views on so do you have any kind of spiritual practices like meditation or is there anything that you do in your life um and do you recommend it to other people yeah that's a good question um I I was meditating at one point and I swear that was, I was like the happiest and I felt Mm. the most spiritually connected to everyone else in the world at that point. Yes. So I think, um, that can be super helpful. I kind of float in between a few things. Like I was doing the healthy minds app for a while. It's a free app. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So you'll just check this out. Yeah. It's, (laughs) it's great because it's free. It's donation based. Um, it's called healthy minds and it's based on research and it's just training the mind to think more positively, to help have self-compassion, compassion for others. And we know that when we do these, these trainings with our brain, with our thinking, that's going to help with our outlook on the world and help with our stress levels. Uh, lately, I've been into affirmations like mm-hmm. Louise Hay and her affirmations, because I really do think that the thoughts we think turn into uh, symptoms and feelings uh, words, actions. And I really do think they shape our environment. Yeah. So I'd affirmations. Say, yeah. I mean, I would say to, to a degree, um, mentally how you feel and how you interpret the things that happen in your life, that really is the root of stress. Like if you just see everything as, as negative, um, then that will be a huge driver for your stress. And if you can kind of change your mindset around it, then you can instantly start to take some of the pressure off. I mean, um, I, I'm working on that on myself. I, I have a tendency to be more pessimistic than optimistic. So mm-hmm. I'm, I've been spending the last couple of years trying to switch that, trying to become more positive. And it, and it has helped massively. So things like journaling and you know reading um, Michael Singer and um, Gary Zukov the, they're the kind of spiritual um, authors they're just fabulous oh. um, <laughs> but like they, they kind of get you to rethink things and to kind of look at things from a larger perspective rather than just like being stuck in your head and kind of being mm-hmm. stuck in um, your day-to-day life like that's all there is when there's just so much more out there and um, you know I still struggle I mean just even last night I was lying awake uh we're, t- we're talking about sleep and stress right now and like myself I was lying awake last night for hours just kind of obsessing over the day before I was just like I shouldn't have said that um oh you know I, I could have done better there and oh no what, what is this person gonna think what is that person gonna think and then I start worrying about the future and I start thinking what's going on like and um I'm not even due on my period like this is just <laughs> <laughs> this isn't even PMS like this is like just me in general and I think a lot of women out there kind of feel the same you know lying awake at night kind of worrying about things and 
I think changing your mindset and finding some sort of um, practice where you can um, center yourself and just get back to who you are um mm-hmm. that is like the key I think along with the things you said like sleep and rest and things so yeah uh, I think it's just that, that if someone can find some sort of practice that can kind of um, get them thinking differently I think that's mm-hmm. really the key to it, healing yes I think so too I mean, I think we can add in a lot of these apps. We can do breathing exercises. We can go on some calm walks. We can take a bath. Like there's, there's things that we can do to help lower our stress. But if we're not prioritizing sleep, if we're still overscheduled, if we're still having a kind of a dreary look outlook mm-hmm. on everything, you know, it's, it's not going to be as helpful. So I do think when it comes to stress reduction, a big part of it is it's hard, but you really do. We have to go within and we have to teach ourselves self-love and be okay with where we're at and know that I'm enough. Uh, I know because sometimes it just sounds cheesy, but it's like, it's so true. True. So true. (laughs) Yeah. And no, it's, it's a process, you know, like we're not going to be an expert in our field when we go into our field you know, it takes years. It, mm. We're not going to have, I always joke around, like, you know, I'm not going to have the experience of a doctor that's been practicing for 20 years. Like, how could I have, I don't have 20 years experience. You know, it's just, a, it's a process. We're all learning together. We're all growing and you just keep putting one foot in front of the other and knowing that right now I'm enough today mm. and I'm excited for the future. I'm excited to. And that reminds to, me of what Brendan Brashard said. Um, he said, um we're afraid of starting small Mm -hmm. and it's like that's basically what you just said it's like we we hate starting small and we hate being seen as someone who's not an expert yet but you know it takes time we've got to put one foot in front of the other um yeah yeah I started so small Mm. (laughs) (laughs) so so small oh my gosh it was terrible and and I had so much anxiety every day and it you know, experience over time, even if it's just a year or two, it really does make a difference. Um, but I guess what I'm trying to say is just knowing that it's temporary, you know, if you are starting small, it's temporary and within a year you're going to feel so much more confident. It's going to be much better just knowing that's temporary and knowing like just, just kind of believing in yourself and feeling comfortable or, trying to feel as comfortable as you can at that moment yeah uh, and uh, mm-hmm. I, I just wanted to kind of um finish up by saying um because I, I don't want to take too much of your time I'm looking at the clock and I'm like God, yeah. I'm just, <laughs> I know we can, we can talk keep- forever oh, yeah exactly <laughs> but like I've been keeping for too long but basically um uh Marie Folio I'm such a huge fan do you know Marie Folio oh mm-hmm. anyway um I love her but um she basically (laughs) said in her book everything is figure outable she's one of the chapters is called um mind the gap Mm -hmm. and she said look your first whatever is going to be pretty shit (laughs) like you know your first patient is going to be is not going to go well and Mm -hmm. your first um whatever you're doing for the first time and you know even for the first couple of years they're not going to be great but she says just mind the gap though like because let's say where you're going to be in 10 years time, you're going to be 10 years, like much, much better. So just accept those beginnings, accept those times in the beginning where you're not feeling great. You're kind of mediocre. Um, everyone feels like they're, you know, you feel like everyone's better than you. Um, but you know, you'll get there one step at a time. So just don't take it so seriously and yep. just keep going. So, yep. There's wise yeah. words. Yeah. Um, oh, that was such a lovely conversation. I feel like we could have talked for even longer, but um, I'm just <laughs> I'm just aware of both of our time. So, um, so yeah, is there is there anything else um, that you wanted to say on the topic? And um, if not, uh, just where can people find out more about you and what you do? Yeah, I would just say we're all in different spots in our lives. Um, so the path that we need to get healthier, to get where we're going is going to be very individualized, very different for all of us. So working with a healthcare practitioner, you know, whether that's Tam, um, can be really helpful in that journey. You know, we all need someone to help guide us and we'll get there. 
Mm. Like everyone can improve. And no. doing a doing a Dutch test wouldn't hurt either. Yeah, if and, if they really want to go into their hormones. Yep, and and Dutch test, you know, DutchTest.com. Mm. That's where you can find us. Um, I guess you can find me on Instagram. Mm. I'm Dr. Kelly Roof, like D R K E L L Y R U E F, F as in Frank. Mm. And um, I was doing a little posting. I need to do some more posting on there, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, doing a Dutch test can be helpful to look at the the cortisol levels, even to look at the sex hormones. And we also measure sex hormone metabolites. So you can see how are you metabolizing your Mm -hmm. sex hormones? Because the way you metabolize them really can affect the symptoms you're having and even risk for breast cancer or prostate cancer. So I think everyone could could, uh, benefit to some degree Mm -hmm. from looking at their, their hormone metabolites. I think maybe a future podcast could be on estrogen, progesterone, like female hormones. That'd be really interesting. I think we should go into that next time. Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, if, if, yep. I mean, it's a very hot topic. So um, I would love to talk about that. Awesome. Yay. Um, Anyway, thank you so much again for coming on. And yeah, we'll we'll be chatting soon. Sounds good. You're welcome. It's great. Great to be here. Thank you for having me.